Hi everyone, welcome to Decolonizing Queer Spaces. I'm actually very excited at how many people came to check this out. This is really cool. Um, I'm proud of all of you for picking this one because it's gonna be the best one. <laughs> so my name is Sam Campbell. I am Dene and Apache and we, uh, we are here today because in all of our backgrounds, we have noticed some discrepancies in how uh, queer spaces treat our beliefs. So I tried to have a wide variety of opinions, but because we can't have everybody on here, I will be moderating this, and I will be also representing some uh, identities that aren't on this panel today with just research that I've done and conversations that I've had with others. Um, I'm Two-Spirit, my pronouns are they, them, and I would like to introduce my amazing panelists that have done so much amazing work, and I'll let them introduce themselves because I don't want to mess up any of their amazing accomplishments, so if you would, please. Oh, okay, I'm starting, okay. <laughs> um, my name is Alexis Sanchez. I am the creator and co-founder of Latinx Geeks. I am Latinx, so Bolivian and Salvadoran. Um, my pronouns are she, her, they, them. And I'm kind of in a stage of trying to figure out more what I'm comfortable with and what I want to represent myself as. It's been a very long process since like probably middle school. Um, but yeah, and you can find us everywhere on Latinx Geeks. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, everything. Cool. cool. Move this closer because I'm short. Uh, so, just to put that straight, I'm Mohawk. And uh, I'm from uh, Toronto originally, so I'm an urban Indian, which is a whole different thing for us growing up. And uh, um, I'm Bear Clan. Uh, I'm a writer, I'm an author of uh, a dozen lesbic books. Um, but before I did that, I was a warrior and I served in the military. So I've spent a lot of time fighting my own beliefs about uh, what's right for our people and our beliefs and trying to reintroduce them and fight with my own beliefs about, you know, queen and country and all of that as well. So, uh, uh, for me, being Indigenous is about recognizing that we all have a lot to do uh, with ourselves first and then our communities. Um, before I talk about myself, I'd like to remind everybody that we are currently sitting on unceded land. Um, so while you're walking around Klexicon and enjoying yourself, just remember someone paid a price for you to enjoy yourself here in Las Vegas. Um, 2019 is the year of indigenous language and I am reclaiming mine, so we're gonna mm -hmm. stumble through this together. Um, <laughs> Tanake, hawa na chiraha, um, Ilwat Waware Lumbi, Ilwat Holly, Ilwat Law Student at the University of Montana. Um, I have my master's degree, uh, cum laude, in Indian law, and I'm currently trying to focus on um, ICWA, um, Indian Child Welfare Act, and um, I'm also uh, trying to double major and get out of there with a JD and an MPA. I know it says MBA on the program, but I'm all about policy change, so if you're gonna fight the system, I better damn well learn how to do it, and it starts with legislation. Um, so, yeah, thanks for coming. Oh, also, I identify as two-spirit and bisexual, and my pronouns are she, um, I can't think. I just wrote a really big brief for law school. <laughs> <laughs> she and her, and you just do you. Whatever you wanna call me is good with me. Yeah, I forgot that part too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I do want to recognize that this is Paiute land. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind as we go through this convention. Um, and I just want to say, Holly, you've come a long way in your language reclaiming from last year, having it written on a little sticky note, hiding it. <laughs> 
good job. Also, Holly does the most amazing beadwork. So if you are interested in good work, this is where you go. So I'm really excited to get this conversation started. So we're going to cover a few topics, and then we will open it up for a Q&A towards the end. Hopefully, we can get to all of your questions. If not, um, feel free if you see me walking around, you can ask me some questions uh, throughout the convention. So we, I would like to ask you all, um, what pre-colonial um, ideals surrounding sexuality and gender have changed after the Western like, um, like genocides or um, cultural assimilation that your people have gone through have been completely erased? We going in order? Okay. <laughs> Whoever wants to okay, answer first. <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, for the Six Nations, uh, I think in your history books it might have been the Six Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, the real name is Haudenosaunee, and that's the Six Nations and the Great Peace. And now with the Haudenosaunee, we had uh, a recognized role of five sexes. And the minute uh, we had uh, connection with the British, that was almost immediately wiped out. So was the matrilineal line. So any group that wanted to have rifles or steel had to uh, invent a male line of succession and teach their males in the uh, Church of England schools. So it was uh, immediately the whole matrilineal law system was thrown out and it turned it over in about uh, maybe a generation. Now, over the last hundred years, when you go onto any Mohawk reserve or Oneida reserve, you'll see that while the longhouses, the male dominated longhouses are still there, the, all the tribal organizations recognize the clan system again. So those clans, the Bear clan, are run by clan mothers who are usually great grandmothers who are picked only by those mothers and only those mothers can vote. And they have the final say in everything that goes on in that community. So that's a good thing that's happening. But recognizing that we had five different genders is long gone, and that's going to be an uphill battle to get people to understand. I think it, since I've been um, working on my language, which is hard because off the top of my head, I only know maybe three people that I can practice Cheryl Catawba with. Um, and asking them what, what I would have been called is so hard because I don't want to sever any relationships I have with those language speakers. Um, my tribe is extremely conservative. On the flip side, my canoe family, their tribes are just the opposite. So I have really embraced myself, um, learned to embrace my role as, as two-spirit through them, but I don't want to know the Lashut seed word for who I am. I want to know the Catawba words for who I am. And this was a conversation I've just recently had like two weeks ago. Um, how do I ask without losing that connection to that language speaker? And I so far have opted not to. And I'm hoping maybe, you know, in a year and 10 years, at some point in my life, I will know how to refer to myself. Um, so I'm a history major and right now really want to focus on is Latin American studies because a lot of the languages in South America and specifically in Bolivia and Peru, which is Quechua and Ayamara, are the most well-known ones. Um, they're still very much spoken, at least in Bolivia. I believe about 40% of the population knows one of those two languages and we have the highest um, indigenous population in South America, but we're still losing a lot. Um, my grandmother is um, from Incan descent. Her family wasn't, they didn't keep too much of the traditions, but many of them they did and she did speak Quechua. So I know words, but I know it how some people know Spanish. I know how to say like headache and like little girl and like, you know, those small words, but we we have lost a lot of that. And a lot of that is because, you know, colonial Spanish rule and Catholicism taking over so hard in South America, because if you didn't accept the Bible, 
you were dead. And at least in, and with South America, it's also difficult because, I mean, obviously we had pre-Incan cultures as well, um, but the Incan Empire did integrate these smaller cultures and communities into their own um, empire. So some of these things do survive, but one of them is, and I hope I'm saying this right because it is in Quechua, is Guarimari or Guariwarmi, yeah, um, which is basically a androgynous, non-binary person who takes up shamanistic roles within the society. So they are the people that teach the younger children and they know the medicine, they know the lores, they're the spiritual guides of these people. And when the Spaniards came in, they would find these people and call them very horrible names and if they didn't change who they were, they were killed. And it was, it, even now, because um, you can still go to Bolivia and you can find, you know, shamans and you can find these medicine people in multiple small places, but they don't take that Guariwarmi role. That's still seen as something degenerate. So even though we do know this history and we are coming back to those roots, things like gender identities is still very much strictly male, female in these indigenous societies. And um, the more I learn, because I definitely am not a uh, pro in this field, I am still learning and hopefully we'll learn more. Um, that's still one of the problems that we face in, in Bolivia, specifically. I think that's a, a problem we face in every community all over the Americas, all over Turtle mm -hmm. Island, is the churches, and it doesn't matter if it was Catholic Church or the Church of England or uh, the Lutheran Church, the uh, Germans sent all kinds of Lutherans into northern Canada, um, and all these churches had their own ideals and they controlled the supply chain. Once you were on a reserve, you weren't out hunting anymore. So if you wanted to feed your kids, you had to listen to what the church said and follow their rules and identify with their genders. And in time, then, um, you know, uh, it has a way of wearing the people down when they give up certain beliefs or adapt and accept that they're degenerate beliefs. So suddenly, in the Mohawk language, which I'm just learning too, uh, there are three genders recognized. But no one will speak that word for the third gender, uh, the non-binary words, because, well, they were taught the same thing. It was bad. So, you know, you would use it to call somebody uh, a swear word instead of accepting that there's this third ideal. So uh, it's a fight all across Turtle Island. I... Um that is all amazing insight. And even in places like Hawaii, they had um, pre-colonial ideas of multiple genders where you were allowed to take on roles that were typically both male and female and um, for men and women. And similar to what um, one of you said was over time, uh, you had to pick one or you were forced into one because of who you, what you looked like and so now like trying to reclaim that into what we do now see is like very religious upbringing like um, countries that have or our country that has a very deep backbone in religion is difficult to navigate this type of situation especially when two-spirit people in the beginning were rounded up by the Spaniards and thrown into pits and had hungry dogs, war dogs, sicked on them. And so that's how they started eliminating the two-spirit. It wasn't, it wasn't just through erasure, through um, religion. It was erasure through genocide and murder. And so now we're living in this aftermath of all of that. And we go into these queer spaces that are supposed to be for us, but a lot of them are very white and Western and um, how... Like what kind of challenges or issues have you experienced while being in um, quote unquote inclusive queer spaces? Oh God, do we have time to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been here, you know, I actually set a, a kind of like a little reminder of my watch to see what time will be the first time someone asked me, why am I wearing a lampshade? <laughs> um, and, and why that, I have a lot of feelings on this. Um, you know, 
I'm gonna go over to like music festivals for a second here. A lot of gay people at music festivals. Um, and I, yeah, okay, there you go. I always wonder, do they have the same internal struggle when they appropriate our, and I won't say our pieces because what they're wearing is made mass production in China. It has no culture, like no religious significance or whatever. Anyway, when they put on the headdress that they bought off of Etsy from someone who wasn't native, do they have a 48 hour struggle like I did? When I, I told my friend, I was like, how the hell am I supposed to speak at this thing and be some kind of like speaker and educator when I'm sitting here telling myself, I'm gonna bring this, but it's gonna sit in my hotel room because I can't handle people staring at me in a space that's supposed to be so fucking inclusive. You know, when I was uh, getting dressed this morning, uh, my wife came in and um, I'm wearing a traditional uh, ribbon skirt and uh, leggings, and um, but I didn't tie my hair back. I didn't put my eagle feathers in it. And uh, I didn't put my blanket over my shoulders. And my wife was saying, well, you just kind of look like somebody wearing a goofy kind of skirt that you know, don't you want to make a statement? And I said, I just want people to see me the way a regular Mohawk woman would be walking around on the reserve. You know, but she might not have leggings on, she'd have jeans on, but she'd still have a wrap around her, wrap and skirt, because that's, it's just the, our way. And I think it's so hard to walk into a place and go completely traditional and not have people I have light skin privilege, and I absolutely recognize that. Although I will say, since I've been in Montana, and there have been parts of Canada that I don't always have that, but I thought today, because I, I like to braid my hair, mm -hmm. and I said, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that because I don't want to seem like I'm trying too hard or trying to out native somebody or something. Yeah. It's my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I had to debate whether I wanted to braid this beautiful, luscious thing that I have inherited from so many grandmothers, mm -hmm. and I feel like even my hair is controlled. Yeah. Because I didn't want to fit. I, 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 yeah, I'm glad we're talking about this. <laughs> I have feelings. <laughs> Let it out. Um, honestly, for me, it's, I can't really start I guess claiming my indigenous roots because my family is so separated from it and my grandma has passed away now um, I can't ask her about her family and where she came from and that history so I'm just doing it by reading accounts from other people and it's difficult because I mean I'm still trying to deal with being Latinx and being gay because I mean you, like, I mean, I figured out very early on that I was like, mm, I'm thinking like girls and boys, hmm, this is different. So, and, and you know, you Google stuff and it's just white lesbianism everywhere and I didn't have anyone to like relate to or to teach me like, I mean, I, the other co-founder of uh, Latinas Geeks, Rain, makes fun of me because she's like, you're such a baby gay. You're so gay, but you're such a baby gay because you're just learning everything. And it's true, like, in the past, like, They four don't give us years. a manual. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I got mine last seriously. week. You should have read like, soon. <laughs> like, she gave me a list of, like, all the movies I had to watch, and I'm like, oh, great. Like, let me watch all these movies about mostly white women falling in love, and there's not a lot, so... Dealing with that and then adding the fact that my family is from Incan descent and from Sucre and that they speak Quechua and but not knowing these people because first of all I'm here in the US, I haven't been back in 14 years and then I have to try to feel confident in that identity in these spaces and when you don't see other people like you, it's extremely difficult. Like, I feel like a fraud sometimes trying to claim that. And I'm still working through it. That is, it's very true. We do often, indigenous people from any piece of the world, we're all indigenous from somewhere. And, um, but when you're so disconnected from it, you do start to feel that imposter syndrome because, um, 
different from most other people who lose their history because they move away, we lose our history because it's just dead. It's gone. Like our buildings are built on top of burial sites. We're plowing through sacred sites for oil pipelines. And so those stories, those histories, everything, the languages, they die with our ancestors. So there's no Google searches, there's no calling up a, a twice removed grandma, you know, you just have to kind of live with what you have. So that leaves us now with this uncomplete history of our gender and sexuality and we want to feel accepted and included in these spaces so how do we take that incomplete history and put it into a full story in order to better these places that we want to feel included in it's an almost impossible question because you're dealing with you know if you looked at, at uh, a timeline of big chunks that are just literally erased so even if you've got great research and, and you're doing the reading, which we're all doing, uh, reading the accounts from people that were written 50 years ago or 100 years ago and putting the pieces together, you still uh, need to argue with the people who are running these places because they're the ones sitting there with, well, there's just two genders and you're going to have to deal with it and we're, we don't let women in the drumming circle and we don't let men in the other circle, in the craft circle, and it's just like, yeah, but I, I'm two spirits, I want to be in the drum, well, mm -hmm. well, we don't even know what that is, so. Mm -hmm. I, I will say I'm a little bit um, lucky in that aspect in that my canoe family, a lot of, I do see a lot of uh, two-spirit people there, and I have a beautiful drum, and I, I use that drum because in that area, in, in, that, in Coast Salish culture, it, women sing and women drum. So um, I, I think I'm a little bit lucky there because it's not so um, set, up, set by gender boundaries. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I feel I love that they. I love that they're my canoe family, and I love that they have taken me as one of their own. But I feel shame in accepting the gifts of their culture when my own tribe has like wants nothing to do with me. So it, I, I really struggle like claiming what they're giving me when what I want, they won't give me. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially within places that were colonized by Spaniards because of the level of synchronism that went into, okay, you can believe in these gods, but this is the real God, and we're going to take, which I mean, I guess is just Christianity in general, just taking things that they call pagan and integrating it in, mm -hmm. into their own holidays and celebrations, and like, I've read, you know, about, you know, saints and, you know, Virgin Marys from different locations, and some of them that there are there. I'm trying to remember where the place, but there is one in um, Los Yungas in Bolivia that is celebrated as a Virgin Mary. But there is a story that it might have been a bam. He might have been one of the last Guatemi in that region, and because you know they tried keeping him as a saint like person, they integrated him into these new traditions. And bringing stories like that into places like these, you know, it doesn't, sometimes it just doesn't work completely. And you have to also deal with people that think your culture is this fun thing and want to use the words that you use, but that they shouldn't. Like, I mean, who remembers like what, eight years ago on Tumblr, everyone was like, oh, two-spirit, two-spirit, two-spirit. It was like, I still struggle to use that word today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel yeah. uncomfortable saying yeah. that word up here on this panel today. Yeah, and I think like stuff like that has, and it's horrible to think this, but has tainted some of the things that we are trying to discover because mm -hmm. people take it and they use it as just this thing with no significance, with no history, with no generations of these stories being told and they just 
use it without understanding the importance. And I mean, yeah, great. Try to learn about your own gender, gender identity and your feelings on these things. But don't do it in a way that diminishes other people's cultures and things that people really struggle with and make it some kind of joke or fun little thing. I mean, that's why, I mean, now I like that people use Patronus and stuff saying spirit animal because mm-hmm. it's the same thing. People are taking things that are not theirs. And I had just long Twitter debates about that. Oh, <laughs> same, same. I don't touch those. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, no, I will go all in. I'm like, say Patronus, stop it. You are, no. So, yeah, it's... I think it's just always going to be something difficult until we make up <laughs> more than just this tiny, tiny fr- fraction of the community. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is, that is true. We make up such a small amount, especially in education, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, Holly, I totally understand what you mean about even being uncomfortable saying it here because I remember last year I was on a panel and right after I had introduced myself as Two-Spirit, the panelist right next to me said, oh, we don't believe in that. So it was kind of like in the middle of, like in the very beginning of the panel, and I sat there like, okay, yeah, you know, but, and yet here I am. (laughs) Exactly, so it, it was this, you know, moment that I really realized like, wow, even in, indigenous spaces, queer indigenous spaces, I'm not completely safe, you know? So um, I do want to say, like, you know, Clexicon has had this panel um, in the past previously with Holly, other panels similar to this, and they do have a two-spirit flag out in the expo hall. And when I saw that last year, I literally started crying, and my friend took pictures of me in front of it, like, posing. I was like, this is the coolest. But it's hard because the only place to buy them, they're like 40 bucks. It's like $16 for the flag and then like 30 something dollars to ship it. And if you ship it to a certain, it's crazy because there's only one supplier. And so from what I'm gathering with all of these things is the lack of education in these types of spaces. So I think um, what we're really leaning towards, especially like, because Queer people of color, or or if you're not comfortable with the word queer, like gay and trans people of color, um, are already an at-risk minority. And then when you throw in that extra indigenous piece into it, it gets it to even a smaller minority. And so, you know, it's not the oppression Olympics. We all have our struggles, we all have a hard time dealing with this stuff. But at certain times and in certain spaces, as we know, certain groups need to have a little bit more attention. And I think right now, um, and especially these types of instances, indigenous and um, colonized people are really having a pushback with the Western ideals. Um, And and I just want to jump on that real fast. This is especially true for black-coded natives. Mm -hmm. Um, I know for a lot of spaces within the black community and within the native community, and I'm not speaking on the black community's behalf, I'm actually not even speaking on the native communities, I'm speaking for me, Um, but I know a a lot of my friends who are black coded and they're native, um, they have, I can't even imagine dealing with, they're, it's all, it's from all sides. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a whole different type of battle. One of our elders is, uh, Choctaw, and she's also black, and it's this really difficult crossroads because you're not native enough in native spaces, but then you're not black enough in black spaces, Mm -hmm. and it's very, like, as an, like, outside looking into this specific crossroads, it's hard, you know, even though within the native community, historically, like, the black and native communities were very close. Oh, the reason my tribe's not federally recognized is because um, we have too much black blood. Literally, Real probably reason. word for word offered up by the government. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So I think what we talk about too is um, I loved what you said, Alexis, about how we're offering up these artifacts and ideas and projects 
with no history behind them. It takes me back to elementary school when we were like, make a totem pole, make your native sand art, make this, you know? And it's, it's cool to want to learn about this stuff and learn how to do it, but without giving history and recognizing where it comes from and what it means is so important because or it's so important to do that because a lot of these things are ceremonial or spiritual and so let's learn about it but let's not participate in it. Mm -hmm. So how can we, with uh, coming back to this idea of like decolonizing our queer spaces, mm -hmm. how can we educate uh, without um, propagating that issue of improper engagement? I mean it's with panels like this. It starts with education. Some people, unfortunately, are just ignorant of the problems, and you can't solve a problem if you don't know it exists. And unfortunately, these spaces are dominated by people with the same ideas that have had these same ideas for generations and make up the majority of the voices. So it's unfortunately, it is up to us to provide these spaces, but it's up to them to, after take this information, do the homework and do better because now you have no excuse. Mm -hmm. You know the information. So if you mess up, and I mean people mess up all the time, that's fine. Apologize, move on, but don't make excuses. Mm -hmm. You know better now. Share this information with people because honestly, people are, like, are not going to listen to us for the most part. Like, they're, we're going to seem like angry people or that we're complaining mm -hmm. or we're trying to take spaces they're gonna listen to other white people. They're gonna listen to other women. That's who has to speak up. It's up to white women to say, hey, listen to this person, because if I do it, they're gonna be like, oh, she's just yelling again. Um, and it's, it gets tiring. That kind of work is exhausting. Like, sometimes you just don't wanna do it because you're tired of having these same conversations. So, I mean, stuff like this is, is where it starts and... You're describing every single law class I sit in every <laughs> single day. I'm like, I came here to get educated and yet here I am telling educated. somebody again. Yeah. Why please don't an expert that. on this? Like, pick up a book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, you can ask. And, you know, whether it's us or other uh, indigenous women, we are willing to teach. We are willing mm -hmm. to share the information. You, you know, where we get upset and fly off the handle is when you you got straight cultural appropriation and no willingness to back up whatever whether artifact or anything else with the knowledge of, of how it came to be whether it's you're hanging a dream catcher in the bedroom window or you know you buy a mandala and a, and a flea market find out what the story is find out this might be a huge traditional piece and it explains something so important and represents a part of our culture that, you know, you really would like to know about because it does matter to us. And we've had so much taken and have so many of those big empty blocks that, you know, what we have left, we'd really like you to learn about and honor. Yeah, I, I want to address the, um, the too angry kind of situation because uh, there's a really great um, poem by Christus, Christus that um, they're always telling me I'm too angry. If you have time, look it up, read it, it's so good. But in one of my classes, we had a very important conversation around anger, and especially when people of color are showing anger. We are written off as like, like you said, like too angry, you're getting emotional, stuff like this, radical. but yeah, I radical. Call, I got called that the other day, I was like, yes. <laughs> If somebody's that mad and passionate about it, there's something wrong. They actually care. They're not mad because they're radical or they're irrational. It's, that's the passion that you're seeing. So even if you're feeling like you're being attacked, take a breath, take a step back, and figure out why they're feeling this. And recognize that it's not necessarily always directed towards you. It's because they've been asked, or not asked, every day for the last two weeks, if someone could touch your hair, can I touch your hair? Can I? And like they just do it without telling you. And then, and then when someone else does it, that's the last straw, and that could be it, right? So you haven't seen everything that led up to this moment. So always keep that in mind when you're dealing with anger. Um, before I open it up for a um, 
Q and A because I I hope that some of y'all have some cool questions. Is there anything else that you all want to address within this um, topic? I think you have to um, maybe keep in mind that we're fighting men in our own space all the time, mm -hmm. um, and we're dealing with issues like missing and murdered Indigenous women. So as this minority of a minority of a minority, we're this little tiny group that no one wants to pay attention to. So if we're too loud and making a fuss, uh, come stand with us and make a fuss too, because uh, it, we need someone to notice though, when things are really wrong. You really do want to stand with us. We've got the best food. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag make Indian tacos $5 again. <laughs> Anything else? No? All right. Any questions? We have, a, we have a little bit of time, and if not, I can totally make up my own questions. <laughs> yes. You can stand if you want. Everybody would love to see that shirt. <laughs> interesting historical issue when we ended quote unquote ended slavery um, there was uh, this one drop rule right if you have one drop of African American blood you're black period right but for natives you have to meet blood quantum right so um, it creates this really difficult thing because we are, like our families, our ancestors are gone. There's not many of us left. So meeting this fake blood quantum percentage thing is difficult for most of us, especially with rape, colonization, stealing your women, stuff like that. Like, um, it's creating this really interesting conflict within our own communities about shunning people from our families who were previously stolen mm -hmm. and are trying to come back and reclaim that. And so I think that's an important first thing to interrogate when looking at the where does it begin, where does it end. But with, do you all have anything to say about specifically like 23andMe or anything else on that? Oh, sure. <laughs> and I'm going to take a little bit of a legal um, reflection on this. The, the first laws around blood quantum were developed in the late 1600s in the state of Virginia and it was written into law that, um, don't quote me on this, I'm trying to remember from my dissertation, but something like they paid white men X amount of dollars to marry native women mm -hmm. and they paid white women, less of course, X amount of dollars <laughs> to be with native men and the goal was to breed them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so with that in mind, the thing about DNA that kind of makes me laugh a little bit, though, is I know families who have had brothers and sisters, same mother, same father, and their DNA results are completely different. Mm -hmm. I don't put much stock in someone coming up to me and saying, oh, I'm 53% Native American. What part of your body is, is it like your head or obviously the hair? <laughs> but... Um, and, and, and so then you've, you've got that. So let's jump over to quantum. My tribe is matrilineal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're 1 1, 1 32nd, 1 256, which I wish the Supreme Court would have realized yeah. when they did the baby Veronica decision. Mm -hmm. um, 
we're not trying to measure up to anything that's on television about how, oh my God, I was walking down the street and holy shit, I'm native. Like, I, when I watch those commercials, I think to myself, and, and I'm not dogging on you because I think that's awesome that you're really like trying to like feel who you are and, and connect. I respect that. I think my thing is I would love to know if people, what their knowledge was of their local indigenous populations or really any indigenous population before they took that test. I want to know, were you invested in our problems? Were you invested in our history? Did you even give a shit? Did you even know about us mm -hmm. before you sent off your kit in the mail? Because what if that kit came back and it said zero percent? Do you give a shit about us now? There are over 576 federally recognized tribes in this country and a hell of a lot more state recognized tribes and let's not forget tribes that were terminated during the termination era of the 50s and 60s by the government. How does that play in when your DNA says you're Native American? So I'm not diminishing anybody who's used that because I know a couple of people who actually have connected to family. They've found fathers, mothers, cousins, grandmas. Like, I fucking think that's awesome. I think that's an ancestor who's trying to bring you back in the fold. But before you send off your test in the mail, I just want to make sure that are you doing it just for you? Are you doing it to be a larger part of this community? How are you contributing once you find or don't find these things that you want to you know, learn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 23 and me doesn't work for someone like me. I'm Latinx, which means I am many things. I have Spanish ancestry, Portuguese ancestry, indigenous, African, Asian, like that for, and it creates someone like me. I look mestizo. So mm -hmm. I look what people usually are like, oh, that's obviously a Latinx person, but some people don't. We have Afro-Latinx people who People are like, you're not Latinx. Like, how does that work? You're black. You can be both. Or <laughs> Asian people that are also Latinx and people don't believe it. So something like 23andMe is just going to tell me the history of how my family and indigenous ancestors were raped and murdered and mm -hmm. stolen from their families. And it's just going to tell me something I already know. I can't learn anything specific from it. The things for me, 23andMe is works in places like the US because first of all there's more people and you know people have been able to keep a specifically white people have been able to keep a history of where they come from like I have a friend that his family came over on like the Mayflower and they have a book of their entire history with names and where they come from but for me like I barely know where my grandma was born in Bolivia. My dad's family in Salvador, which was torn apart by a civil war that he literally had to escape from, they, people there didn't get married. Like, you kind of just lived with someone for your whole life and had kids with them. You didn't get legally married, so there's no record of that. So I'm not gonna find anything if I take something like that. It's just gonna tell me kind of stuff I already know. And if it tells me anything of significance, it's just gonna be my European side, which I kind of know. Like my great -grand grandmother came here like to Bolivia when she was like 18 from Portugal, maybe because she might have traveled from Spain to Portugal, but that's that's as much as gonna teach me, and I don't care too much <laughs> about that. So yeah, yeah, and the blood quantum laws are being used against us as well. So it's another form of colonization. So instead of the clan's mother saying, you know, yeah, you're a bear clan and you're part of our community, uh, some test from some lab is telling you that, you know, you maybe you were something else or, you know, a bigger part of another community. And uh, if you need to find that out, if that's important to you, then do it. But You've got to ask yourself the hard questions too. Do I want to be part of this community? Do I want to, uh, or do I just, am I using this so I decide how to decorate my house? Because if that's your thing, then, you know, I, I'm really sorry you're doing that because you missed the big picture. Yeah, so I think overall, if, if you do find that you're partially indigenous, yes, ask yourself the hard questions, and then look up your local, like, 
Let me see. Raise your hand if you know whose land you live on. Awesome. So if you don't, look it up when you get home or now or like when you leave this room because it's important. And look up issues that are going on nearby and what you can do to, to help show up to protest. Show up. Amplify. Yeah, amplify. This is really to everybody. Show up. This is what we need, you know. And again, and, we use yeah. I got good food and just <laughs> <laughs> you do not go home hungry. That's so true. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What can we do to make your spaces more comfortable? Listen to us. Listen to us. Invite us to talk, invite us to share our stories. Mm -hmm. Our stories are amazing, <coughs> and yes, there's good food too. <laughs> and, uh, so the stories tell you who the people are, and they also tell you about what's happening now. But if you want to know why, you know, why do Native women act that way? Well, first of all, there's like 750 different nations, mm -hmm. so it, you would never refer to a German in France and say he's French. Uh, it, that you'd have the two guys babbling it out on the street. But uh, it, it's, it's become okay to just say, well, you're indigenous. Well, yeah, and I'm, you know, Haudenosaunee and Kianagaga, or Mohawk, and, you know, so all these other things are integral to who we are. So listen, ask us to talk. I think breaking down stere like tropey stereotypes mm -hmm. is a damn fine place to start. Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I will just tell you that I have had people come up to me and say, well, you can't be indigenous because you have a southern accent, and they 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 were all got pushed away, and I was like, a bitch, some of us aren't around. <laughs> like, <laughs> we didn't feel like moving. Um, and, and to that end, I've actually had another indigenous person to me say that, uh, well, your tribe doesn't have a casino, so you guys really aren't, you know, whatever. And I'm just like, oh, you people. But it's it's just, so kind of things like just breaking down your own personal, like what you think. Because, like, I guarantee if you go to Pembroke, North Carolina, they, a lot of them going to look like me. They're probably not going to look like this person or this person or this person. That, so just this whole, that's what they look like. That's what they sound like. That's mm -hmm. what... That or that's what they do. I mean, I some people I'm like, oh my gosh, you're in law school. Oh my god. Like, the funny, I will say, talking about two spirit roles. Um, in a lot of tribes, we actually were the mediators, and mm -hmm. we would have been the uh, attorney. So I feel like I'm actually reclaiming part of that. And the other thing is, so I've seen a lot of people look at, at my hat, which is great. Um, there is nothing wrong with. To me, I'm not speaking for every indigenous person out there, but when someone respectfully comes up, I'm like, man, you know, that is really cool. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, and we have, like, native women. I mean, sometimes I almost feel like I know if somebody's native or not by their sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so we're not stoic and very, like, we fucking love to laugh and we poke fun at ourselves all the time. So just asking is, is, is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like if you're creating, if you are in the process of creating a queer space on campus, on in a, in a community center, whatever, talk about these other identities. And remember, it's not just like North America; it's S South America, Central America, the Philippines, Hawaii, India. Like we all have every inhabited con continent has Australia. Australia. You know, like ev every everyone has something different. Like learn about it talk about it in your space with your members so that way when we are walking around wearing our traditional um, regalia, our ribbon skirts, anything, people aren't just staring. It's like, oh, yep, that's you, you know? I sh like, we shouldn't have to feel like if we're going to be stared at or not, you know? And one thing, when you're meeting someone, this happened to me at a very, like, I was at a meeting for diversity councils. I am in a diversity council, and it's the first time we're meeting in person. Um, if you're listening to this, yes, please take note. Um, I, I walked up, we have to introduce each other, you know, all those like icebreakers. And two different, two different people at two different times shook my hand and put their hand over their heart and like half bowed and was like, it's a, it was an honor meeting you. And I'm like, 
Um, I had someone I, at law school yeah. tell me, they met me and they said, I'm sorry for what my ancestors did. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> it is 841 and I have not even had my cinnamon roll. So we yeah. went there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So just be respectful and create a space where all of the members and staff and faculty are aware that these differences exist and like that these differences um, are very unique and just a wide variety of everything. There was another question over here. I don't yeah. understand. I'm just thinking. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I understand you're reclaiming your language, mm -hmm. and a lot, of, I'm assuming most of you guys have a background of coming from historically more, like you tell your stories and you write them down. So, when you reclaim your language to learn about your stories and learn about your history, do you also want to get uh, or try to find other people's stories just because? they are also Native American or because you're queer as well. Do you try to kind of grow out your lens to find more queer people in your community or do you try to find queer people in your tribe? I just met, and I didn't even meet, I read about her and introduced myself online. <laughs> yeah. um, the, That's how it goes. Yeah, the first um, lesbian woman from my tribe I am in my 30s, and I didn't, that, that was a first, like, so I have to branch out. And, and, I, and I love that, because I get to hear all these amazing stories, and I get to hear, you know, all these amazing, like, their, like, what they went through, and how their tribe was supportive, or was not supportive, and it's just awesome, like, connecting, because it's a reminder that even though we're two-spirit, that homo there's there's no homogenous native like we're still even within that we're still super different and that's what I love about indigenous people like we are just so everything but there's there's from A to Z we run the gamut and I, that's one thing I've enjoyed learning about other like stories from other people yeah and that's that's really important for us uh, for me too I find uh, we all have different stories and it comes right from our creation myths in, in that nation to what the role of a two-spirit person was. So, you know, in the Haudenosaunee, the two spirits, the minute they figured out you were two spirits, and they would do a little, you know, death test when you were four to figure this out, it, you were automatically put on this fast track to become a medicine person, whether you were going to be a, a, a lawyer type thing. Uh, a chief, uh, a leader, uh, but it was automatically understood, oh, this person's two spirits. They, they, they've got two things going for them. Let's get them all the help they can to become whatever they were meant to be. So uh, learning that and sharing the stories, those things are, are, are really, it's a lot of work, but worth it. Yeah, I mean, like, we've lost so much that we kind of have to find other people's stories mm -hmm. to just supplement it a little bit because you might find like one or two things and that's that's nowhere near enough to learn about your people so yeah. very quickly before that I just want to let everybody know Duolingo does now have Navajo and Hawaiian so that's been a huge step in like language reclamation and so people translating their stories into those languages is helping so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing about how we can uh, create spaces for learning. Um, okay. Do you have any examples or sort of tips about how to um, avoid being in sort of a tokenism environment? Um, like, as a white person, I want to help create space to amplify um, indigenous people and your concerns um, and. I'm sure there's been a whole lot of times when white people have invited you to various spaces and you probably felt like you were a token. Mm -hmm. um, so just if you could share some of those um, examples so we can learn some lessons and not repeat them. Yeah, um, <clears throat> like you said, like tokenism is specifically when it feels like I was invited here to be that queer person or that person of color. You know, so I think if you're creating a space that's meant for like queer people or it's a community organization or anything, um, definitely reach out to the indigenous community in the area. It's super rare that we get any type of, hey, we have a space for indigenous students. Like I'm lucky to have one on my campus at San Francisco State. 
It's called the Student Council of Intertribal Nations. And so it's for all students, you know, but it is also a safe haven for the indigenous students. And what's really cool is we've created connections with the, like with the BSU, with Mecha, with La Raza, you know, everybody on campus. And so it's created this inclusive space on its, on its own. So when you have your own space, a queer space, send out something to local high schools or colleges, community colleges, say like, hey, we have a space where inclusive of, inclusive of like queer, people of color, like indigenous, bring, you know, and even just seeing that name or that word will perk a lot of people up and get them excited. Because it really shows them like, we're here for you, not like we want you to come and like show off who, like we have you. I think is a, an important distinction between the two. I think a super easy thing is not introducing your friends as, hey, this is Holly. She's gay and native. I'm like, so we're doing this. Oh, okay. Hello. Um, You're like, you forgot amazing. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you could start off with fabulous. The other, two. The, uh, the other thing is um, be careful when, when you hear people using Amplify Voices. Um, the NALSA group at my law school just elected a cisgendered straight white male who has done absolutely nothing for the group where I have busted my ever-loving ass and come out multiple times at multiple events. And he put the magic words, amplify voices. And oh my gosh, he's now president. I'm like, that happened. So. Just be wary when people talk about, are they amplifying their own voice so people think they're amplifying voices? Or are they really saying like, I'm gonna step aside and let this person speak. I step aside when I can. If I see somebody who is a brown native or a black coated native, I'm like, I'm native, but you know, I'm actually gonna let this person take the floor. So just knowing when to step aside, which I'm about to do for this wonderful elder. Right here. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. Thank you. It, it is, uh, geez, now, now I can't talk. <laughs> On the spot. On the spot, yeah, yeah. Uh, creating a safe space is about inviting and listening. Um, so to get away from tokenism, you've got to understand that you can't just uh, order up natives, you know. And, and, and literally, I was on a, a As hard as we try, we haven't figured out how to 3D print them yet. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I was on, on this committee, and, and we were doing this, this phone uh, meeting, and one of the women said, well, we want to increase uh, the number of Native women who come to this thing. And I'm like, okay, first of all, you're on the phone with me, so you don't realize I'm Native. And second of all, it's not like you can just order them up, baby, and, and say, okay, we want to increase the number and diversity. Uh, you have to be able to offer something that Native women want to take part in. And that's not always these things, and you have to recognize that that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm from the Comic-Con world, so New York Comic-Con, Flame-Con, Seattle Comic-Con, like, I'm also at Comic-Con. And, uh, you know, on panels like this, like, you can have more than one. Like, you can have two black women on a panel, or two Latinx people, or two indigenous people. Like, you don't need just the one. Like, it works. And also, don't just put us on diversity panels. Yeah. I know other things. <laughs> like, you know, like, I, I, I read comics and I watch TV and I like movies. Like, I don't just have to be your diversity person. So, have more than one of us and let us talk about other things. Like, this is good because you know what? You organize this. Mm -hmm. This is us saying, hey, we want to teach you something. But we don't want to just talk about this if, for, like, if you're asking us, like, yeah. And seriously, have more than one. Like, I make it a goal now to have, like, panels. I'm sorry, guys, but with no white people. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, to have the attention sorry so, yeah <laughs> i wanted to do like a law type panel next year and i'm like i don't think they're going to pick me because they're like well you need to be over at that other panel <laughs> <laughs> seriously
Well, I think that is all of our time. This was amazing. This was a wonderful conversation. I understand anxiety is a thing. So if you didn't, if you have a question you didn't want to ask it in front of everybody, and you see me walking around, feel free to ask questions. Uh, thank you to all of you. Uh, we do have to give the room up to the next group. So thank you all for coming. This was awesome. I need a picture of all of it.